Good morning and welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today. Now, if you've been following our live streams, welcome back. It's great to have you. But if you're new to Nature Live Online, we're an event where we give you a chance to meet some of the scientists, researchers and curators that work behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London. You can find out all about them and the work that they do. And you can often see some aspects of the collection that you wouldn't normally get to see. Now, the museum has, of course, reopened to the public, which is fantastic. And we put lots of brilliant measures in place to ensure that you have a safe visit. But not everyone can make it to the museum. So we're bringing our science and our scientists direct to you at home. Now, today we're going to be chatting about octopuses living and extinct with our curator, Zoe Hughes. Now, remember, we are live and we love to hear from you, our audience. So if you've got any questions or comments at all during the stream, post them in the comments. We'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can. But let's meet our scientists for today. Zoe, are you there? Hi. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> hey, Zoe. It's, it's brilliant to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Now, let's start, um, first of all, by finding out what you do at the museum. Um, so I am a curator in our Earth Sciences Department. Um, I care for two collections that are quite different. Um, one is the Brachiopod collection. So that is both fossil and recent. So I basically look after all Brachiopods at the NHM. Um, and then I also care for the fossil Cephalopod collection. Um, looking after the collection is amazing. It's been exceptionally strange over the past few months. Um, I've gotten quite a lot of my documentation backlog worked through sitting in my kitchen, which has been quite <laughs> nice. Um, but on a normal day, I would, if I was in the museum, I would be looking after research visitors, answering inquiries from outside and inside the museum. Um, I do a little bit of research. I also sometimes am allowed to go do field work, um, go to conferences and that sort of thing. <laughs> so it's a very varied job. Um, and they sometimes let you go out and actually hunt for fossils as well, don't they? We've got a brilliant yes, picture of you there <laughs> rocking that bin liner. Is that typical fieldwork dress? Uh, no, it tends not to be the typical fieldwork dress. Um, we were actually in Morocco, a large group of earth scientists, and I got dropped off at the site and my colleagues went off to another site um, and I left my raincoat in the van. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it started raining, which we weren't really expecting in Morocco, so I had to figure it out with a bin bag. <laughs> Improvised. I love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. <laughs> now we are we're not going to talk about brachiopods today. We're actually going to focus on okay. the, the fossil cephalopods, which is a fantastic part of the collection that you actually look after. But yeah. what exactly is a cephalopod? So a cephalopod is a type of mollusk. So there's loads of different types of mollusks. Um the, there's three main main groups. Um, there's lots of other ones, but if I start going into those, we'll be here forever and we won't get to octopuses. Um, so the three main ones, you will have seen a snail. Um, so those are part of the gastropods, which literally means stomach foot. And if you think about how they move along, they literally move along on their stomachs. Um, then you've got the bivalves, that literally means two shells. So that's everything like clams, oysters, mussels, that sort of thing. And then the next major group is the cephalopods. So living today, you've still got the cuttlefish, the squid, octopuses, the nautilus. And then in the fossil record, um, we've also got belemnites and um, ammonites. They are some of my favourite animals. So I'm particularly uh, really excited about uh, our talk today. We've already had a question, quite an important question through on YouTube okay. about uh, the plural. What's the plural, the proper correct uh, plural of octopus? Is it octopi or octopuses? Now, I know you've got strong feelings about this. It's, it's very important. OK, so um, octopi is completely wrong. Um, if you are pluralizing, calling them octopi. Um, so octopus, the word has its origins in Greek. And when you pluralize with an I, that's actually a Latin pluralization. So you're trying to squish two ancient languages together, which you probably shouldn't do. Um, so there's actually two correct terms. There's the one that I like, um, octopuses, but there's a slightly fancier sounding octopodes. Oh, octopodes. Yeah. I quite like that. Yeah, my housemate <laughs> likes that one. <laughs> I'll try and use that a bit more often. So uh, <laughs> there are two main types of octopodes, aren't there? There are, indeed. <laughs> nice use of them. <laughs> um, so, yes, there are. There are the serrate octopuses and the inserrate octopuses. Um, the one you can see on the screen at the moment is an inserrate octopus, and they tend to live a lot shallower. 
So if you've seen an octopus out in the wild, it's most likely, unless you're a deep sea diver, um, it's most likely to be one of these ones. Um, their key features, um, don't, they don't have any fins. They don't have any webbing between their arms and they do produce ink. So those are the three key features. This might pop up a bit later. And then your insurate octopuses, um, those are your deep sea ones. And they are all so, so intensely adorable. So they've got those lovely little fins. So they also have um, a bit of shell in the top of their mantle, which acts as um, an attachment for those fins because you need something for them to work along. They also have some webbing between their arms. And because they live in the deep, deep ocean, having black ink is kind of useless. So they don't. Um, unlike some deep sea squid, which actually have bioluminescent ink, octopuses haven't figured that out. I love the deep sea octopuses. The the fins are absolutely brilliant. So are they for swimming, presumably? Yeah, they just swim around and move around. There's loads of yeah. videos of them looking just adorable on oh, YouTube. They're amazing. They, look, they don't look real, some of them. They look like cartoons almost. Yeah. I would highly recommend. There's a brilliant video from Nautilus, Nautilus Live. I think it's called Shy Octopus. Oh. That one's my yeah. favourite one. It's so cute. <laughs> I would recommend after the talk, obviously, Googling yeah. that one and, and looking it up. It's it's absolutely brilliant. So they're fantastic animals. And so whereabouts in the world do we do we find them? Are they pretty much everywhere? Um, they live everywhere in the sea. There's no freshwater octopuses. There's no freshwater cephalopods at all. They can't. They need that salt. Um, so, yeah, they live pretty much everywhere. Um, they're very diverse. They're doing really, really well. Um, yeah. So everywhere, really. <laughs> um, and let, let's uh, talk a little bit about their their anatomy because they've got some amazing features. I mean, they're they're very strange in themselves. That's why <laughs> um, they're wonderful. <laughs> they are. They are. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, what do they eat, for example, and, and how do they feed? Okay, I have my little cuddly friend here to help me demonstrate this. So they will eat um, pretty much as many animals, anything they can get their hands on. Um, so some of them will try and eat fish. Um, uh, cephalopods and fish have been in an evolutionary arms race for most of geological time that they've both been around together. Um, they also like eating things like clams and crustaceans, so crabs and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, the size of their prey very, very much depends on the size of the octopus. There's some really, really big octopuses and some really, really small ones, so that varies. And the way they catch their prey is they will grab it with one of their arms and then put it in up into their beak so their mouth parts are actually here my my little cuddly one doesn't have any mouth parts so you just have to imagine but they just grab the food and then bring it into where their mouth parts are just in the middle there right and they they have this this beak don't they which i think we've got yes. an image of that's pretty terrifying <laughs> well you don't so most of that will be covered you won't actually see that much of it sticking out of the octopus um this is quite a large one. Um, I've got a similar beak um, in the collections that I use for a lot of outreach that's actually from a Humboldt squid, and it's probably about that size, but that animal would have been about six feet long, so smaller mm. octopus will have smaller beaks. Um, you can see why it's called a beak. It looks very, very much like a bird beak. Um, so the side not on the hand, like the non-hand side, that is the end which we actually use to crunch through all of those crabs and things. So that needs to be really powerful and really tough to break through hard shells of other animals. But you'll notice on the other side, so where the hand is, it actually looks quite thin. Um, and that is to allow the octopus to actually attach the soft tissues of the octopus onto the beak. And if it was really, really tough, as soon as the octopus took a bite, it would actually lacerate itself with the reverse of its beak. So not an ideal thing. So it goes from being quite soft to quite hard, that structure. And in the middle there, where there's sort of the hole in between all the arms, that's where the beak would be. So as I demonstrated with my little cuddly friend, he just sort of he would grab food and bring it in to the middle. Wow, well, wow, pretty formidable. If you're a little fish or a little uh, little yeah, <laughs> little mollusk, not a, not a nice thing to encounter. Uh, they've got some uh, amazing ways of of moving around, haven't they, octopuses? They do, yeah. Um, so they have two ways, mate. Two main ways of moving around. One, they have a siphon which would sort of sit about sort of here-ish. This cuddly one, again, doesn't, he's not very accurate. I need a better octopus. Um, and they suck in water through the siphon and then squish it out. So then they travel sort of backwards. So that's better with my hand. So it's sort of like that sort of motion. Um, but they can also use those arms to walk about on the seafloor. Um, and this is quite different to, say, how an ammonite would work. 
um, because ammonites are stuck with the siphon, they can only ever go backwards. Whereas octopuses and cuttlefish can actually have a little bit of a wander and they can go forwards, which must be oh. finesse. <laughs> wow, that is that's fantastic. I didn't know that actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, I do love that 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 walking movement. Um, we've had a great question from uh, YouTube actually asking, which is quite relevant to to that that walking. Asking, do all cephalopods have eight tentacles? No, no, don't we? <laughs> okay, so let's stick to octopuses for a moment, and then I'll explain what's going on with the rest of the cephalopods. Okay, um, octopuses, and um, if you take one thing away from this, octopuses have no tentacles. <laughs> They have eight arms, ah, which is uh, a, a little question I've been sneaking into the pub quizzes I've been making for my friends during lockdown. Um, I'm ashamed that quite a lot of them got it wrong. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So the difference between um, an octop um, an arm and a tentacle, basically, imagine he has suckers. An arm has suckers all the way from the tip to what we call the arm crown, and that's where they all come together and where the beak is. A tentacle only has suckers at the end and this part would be smooth so an octopus has eight arms whereas a squid will have eight arms and then you can see in this picture here don't know why i'm pointing at it um you can see in this picture here um it's got two longer appendages going towards its body those are the tentacles and you can see there's only suckers at the very end and part of them are smooth um now because ammonites are close we think ammonites are closer related to the coleoid group so that's the group of cephalopods that have or the octopuses, cuttlefish and squid, we think that they probably had eight or eight arms. I think that's the current uh, understanding. Whereas Nautilus, and this is going to throw my rule of tentacles completely out there, um, they have about 90 tentacles, but they have no suckers on those tentacles. So the sucker rule only really applies to coleoids, so your squids and your octopuses and your cuttlefish. Okay. So, do, and do all octopuses have eight arms? Just eight arms? Yes. Are there any species that have any more arms? If there are, I'm unaware of them. There is <laughs> there's a seven armed octopus in Finding Dory, I think, but that's because it had an accident. Um, oh. Yeah, they all have eight arms. <laughs> that really um, and, me off. <laughs> yeah. and uh, a related question from uh, Jacob, who is age nine on YouTube. Uh, this one is about the the colossal squid, oh, okay. um, and he's asking uh, wh why do they have hooks on their tentacles? Brilliant question. Love that. Okay, mm -hmm. so. We're going to travel back in the fossil record slightly. Um, in the Jurassic, and I've got some beautiful examples back in the NHM, um, there are some early squid-like animals. You can't describe them as squid because squid don't fossilise. We can get into that another time. Um, so they are squid-like animals. And on their tentacles, they have little hooks. So these hooks were the first thing, one of the first sort of the, the more basic, basic um, adaptations of them. And that allows them to like grip onto things. These through time and um, yeah, through the evolution of that coleoid lineage, some animals, so often they will have like a ring of hooks, but basically the colossal squid hasn't quite got to the ring of hooks or it didn't, its lineage didn't have the ring of hooks, so it's still got the original hooks. But they use them, to go back to what the question is for, to basically grab onto things. So it allows them to get a better grip. Very cool, very cool indeed, uh, and a great question. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, we've had another uh, quick question from Andrew on uh, Facebook asking, "How long octopuses live?" Um, depends on the octopus. Uh, smaller ones don't tend to live as long. I think bigger ones can get to about five years. I think she says, scouring her mind. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think bigger ones can get to about sort of five years. Um, yeah, I should really know that. My brain's pit. Things have fallen yeah, out of my brain during lockdown. They're not, Sorry. They're not very um, long lived, I think, from, they don't live from, very long from my reading. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, and cuttlefish um, only live about a year. Like they would be the yeah. most amazing pet, but they only live about a year. And mm. you bond with them and you get really sad, apparently. I know some yeah. people who've done a lot of research with living uh, cuttlefish. They are they're amazing animals, and I can definitely see how people would would bond with them. They've Ooh. got so many fantastic adaptations. There's there's too many uh, almost to talk about. But we mentioned um, ink a little bit earlier. So so yes. why do they why do they tend to have ink? Um, so this primarily is um, a defence mechanism. So if you think about a magician vanishing in a puff of smoke, the ink allows the octopus to be able to or the squid to be able to do a very similar thing. So if they feel threatened either by a predator or a diver coming and having a poke around because they're interested, they can 
release this ink, which they keep stored in an ink sack. Um, they can release the ink and the clouding in the ocean allows them to get away without being seen. And whereabouts is the ink sack? Is that in their, in their head? So the ink sack is in their body. So it's oh, sort okay. of central in their body. And then they can squirt it out. And they actually squirt it out through their bum. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. And, and is it is it purely sort of defensive or could they use it to um, confuse prey, use it in hunting? Yeah, they can use it in hunting to confuse prey, yeah. It's, so. a, it's, a, it's a brilliant adaptation, being able to ink. <laughs> yeah, and it's what I, I wish I had. <laughs> I know, it would be handy, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, yeah. I, I read um, somewhere that all octopuses are venomous. Is that right? That is correct, yes. So this is the famously venomous octopus the blue ringed octopus that live in australia they are really really tiny really really beautiful but horrifically venomous if you ever see one don't touch it um just leave it be um but all octopuses have some venom and that basically allows them to subdue their prey so you were worried about those fish um getting a bit scared don't they would get vent they would have some venom injected into them and they would be completely fine well they'd still get eaten but it wouldn't be probably quite a stressful experience so they all have venom to subdue their prey, but it's like, don't start being afraid of octopuses. Most of them, the venom is too weak to affect a human. Not that I'm condoning going and poking octopuses. Please don't do that either. Oh no, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> now the, the blue ringed octopus, it is, it is stunning, isn't it? That that gorgeous um, blue pattern, that coloration, presumably is that, to, is that a, a warning that's saying I'm venomous? That's a warning, like do not touch me, leave me alone. Um, I've noticed quite a worrying trend of recently on social media, people finding these and posting pictures of them holding them. And every time we see one, I'm like, what on earth are you doing? Are you insane? Um, so don't pick up animals, certainly not really venomous ones for your Instagram post. Um, uh, <laughs> no. Definitely not. Yeah, the, the, this whole bright colour kind of thing doesn't quite work on humans, does it? No. <laughs> like, it's a warning coloration. No. The venom that blue winged octopus has is a really complex, really nasty venom. It's very similar to a pufferfish venom, um, and it it can paralyze and kill you really quickly. So, mm. yeah, don't don't mess with those, please. Yeah, absolutely. From admire from a distance, definitely. Yeah. Now, octopuses obviously they're very well known for their amazing ability to change color. Yeah. So, so how does that work? Um. So they have a. A load of cells in their skin called chromatophores and these are basically pigment cells so you can see that's what they they look like under a microscope um and essentially in the simplest sense they are different layers of pigment stacked up on each other and so they can use they can contract the top layer and that shows the, the one below um and this is done through electro electric um signals through the skin so if you look at a video of um, an octopus or something changing colour and really slow it down. You can actually see it travels across like a wave. It's an incredible ability. And we've got obviously this video here. It's not just the, the colour change. They also change the, the, the texture of their skin as well, don't they? Yeah, very cool, isn't it? So they can hide and pretend to be a bit of coral to make sure that everyone leaves them alone. Yeah. A lot of octopuses, please leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. It's totally convincing as well. You would said would have yeah. said that was a bit of coral, and then you get that rapid change as well. And see how quick that is there. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's just brilliant. And what do they they use this this color technique for? This color changing is it mainly to camouflage themselves? So yes, one use is to camouflage themselves, and the other is to communicate. So they can really let other octopuses know how they feel through their skin, and um, cuttlefish do this as well. And a really cool example is, imagine you've got three cuttlefish. You've got two males and then a female on this end. The middle male wants to mate with the female, but he also doesn't want to let this one, the other male, know, know what's going on. So they can actually change colour, different colours on each side. So on this side, the female side, he might be going, oh, yeah, come on, come on. You know, you're interested. And on this side, the male, he's just going, nope, not to see here. Nope. <laughs> so you can actually do different things to communicate different things, which is really quite cool. It is amazing. It is amazing. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had a couple more questions. I just want to get to before we move on. Um, just going back to the uh, octopus venom, we had a question from Periscope asking how they inject the venom. Uh, that'll be through the beak. So when they bite, that'll be yeah. 
uh, as if that beak wasn't scary enough you've got the venom as well <laughs> Um, and then we've got a question from Facebook. Uh, Glenn was asking, is it true that squids have the biggest eyes in the animal kingdom? Um, yes. So the giant squid has the biggest eye in the animal kingdom, which when I do my um, dinosaurs, oh, I miss dinosaurs, uh, when oh. I do my science show for dinosaurs, um, I always, always have at least one kid that comes up and goes, you've told us all about that, but what about the colossal squid? Um, the colossal squid doesn't have a bigger eye. Parts of it are bigger than other bits of it. It depends how you're measuring size. If you're just measuring it on the body, then yes, the colossal, no, oh, hang on. Bits, it depends. So if you use one measurement, the colossal squid is bigger. If you use another measurement, the giant squid is bigger. Um, but their eyes, yes, the biggest animal in the eye, in the animal kingdom is the uh, giant squid eye. Amazing. <laughs> Um, we had a, a question uh, from uh, Chloe on YouTube, uh, just asking, we, we touched on this earlier, how they change their colours. Can we just uh, quickly uh, go over that one again? For Chloe? Sure. So it's basically using those pigment cells in their skin mm -hmm. um, and they can show different coloured pigment cells um, and they change the colour with electrical signals that pass through the skin. In the simplest, that's as simple I can go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> very very cool these, these these little cells opening and closing getting bigger and smaller yeah. and changing the color it's amazing absolutely amazing um now we we obviously know quite a lot about octopuses living today but if we want to uh, learn how and when they evolved we have to turn to the fossil record which as it turns out is quite tricky do we know bit. when when they first evolved um no simply <laughs> we i can tell you <laughs> Um, if someone's figured it out, I haven't read that paper yet. Um, I can tell you when the first octopus fossil was found, like when it, we know there was definitely a fossil octopus. Um, so the oldest fossil octopus in the world is about 300 million years ago. And that was found in Illinois. I think it was Illinois. Yes, somewhere in Illinois. So that's in America. Then we've got a massive gap of about 150 years, uh, 150 million years, sorry, um, to the jurassic when there was a fossil octopus found in france that one is beautiful i would love to go and see that one in real life it is an exquisite specimen and then another gap to about 96 million years when um we actually have quite a number of fossil octopuses that were all found in lebanon so in terms of the fossil record it's very sparse um to say the least so i can tell you that's why i i can't tell you when for definite they first evolved because we don't entirely know. I can just tell you when the first fossil octopus appeared. Right. So 300 million years ago, we had that first uh, fossil, yes. but they, they could have evolved even yes. earlier than that. They, they could, could well have evolved. Fossil. Well, it's not even that. They quite possibly, because if you think about what normally fossilizes, if you imagine, put yourself in the museum and you think about, say, all of our paleontology galleries, most of the fossils that you have are bones, teeth and shells. So they're the hard parts. And the problem with octopuses is they're really, really squishy. So mm -hmm. you actually need really, really specialist conditions to get them to fossilise. So if those conditions weren't around when the octopuses were around, they wouldn't have fossilised. So there probably won't be anything there for us to find. That's the so, basic problem with octopuses. So what sorts of conditions do we need then for those soft bodied animals to fossilise? So in order to get really, really good soft tissue preservation, you need um, very, very fine sediments. So when the animal dies, oh, no, dead octopus. You need very, very fine, fine sediments to land on top of that that um, body of that octopus. It needs to fall very fast. Um, you also need an anoxic, so an oxygen free environment so that there's nothing living there that will start munching at it or it so it won't be able to naturally decompose. Um, and a colleague of mine did some research a few years ago and discovered that in addition to that, for, for octopuses, you also need a really low pH. So it needs to be quite acidic. Oh. So there's some volcanism or something. So that's why the fossil record of octopuses is really quite sparse. Yeah, those are some very specific yeah. um, conditions. How many fossil octopuses are there in the world? Do you know? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I would put money on there being less than 200 of them. Um, and most of them, all but two, are all from the Cretaceous in Lebanon. So that is where you tend to find those fossils. Um, and I was speaking to the owner of some of those quarries, which they use primarily for sort of building materials, but they also have um, a fossil business because they find lots of fossils in their rocks. Um, so bear in mind, they've got a full proper working quarries. I think they've got three or four of them. 
with people every day of the year, fossiling, like quarrying away, finding fossils. He told me that they find a fossil octopus on average about every four or five years. And that's yeah. where they're. <laughs> <laughs> so they are incredibly rare, but we do have some in our collection, don't we? How, how, roughly how many do we have? We have four. So in our <laughs> entire museum collection of 80, 80 million specimens and in the fossil cephalopod section, I think we've got at least half a million ammonites. Um, we have four fossil octopuses, which just goes to show how rare they are. <laughs> yeah. And there we go. We, we, we can show some of them to our, our viewers today. So, so tell us a, a bit about these specimens. So where were they found, first of all, and, and roughly how old are they? So all of these specimens are from Lebanon and all of them are about 96 million years old. Um, yeah. So we don't have a, a, a very wide ge geographic spread. But remember that there's only two fossil octopuses in the entire world that aren't from Lebanon. So, yeah, we, we yeah. can't expect to have too much. Um, <laughs> so this one is actually a particularly special fossil octopus. Um, this is the holotype. So this is the specimen that described this species. So when you describe a species, you have to allocate a specimen or a series of specimens that show all the features that you want your species to have or your species does have. Um, you need to write about it and you need to like submit pictures. Um, and so this is the holotype. So anyone who studies this group um, comes to the museum or gets in touch with me and asks me questions. They might want pictures. They might want to look at this specimen. Um, so, yeah, so this is the holotype of Paleoctopus newbaldi. This is the first fossil octopus that the NHM acquired. Um, we acquired it when the Geological Museum became the British Geological Survey and they got rid of all of their material that wasn't British. They gave it all to the NHM. Um, and we got this in 1924. So we've had this one quite a while. Wow. And it's it's very obviously an octopus. You can you can see a lot of the features there. It is. Yeah. So you can see those lovely arms. And then if you look at the body, um, you can see there's a little sort of hole right in the centre of the round part. That mm. is where the ink sac would have been. Um, but then. Oh, so I told you earlier that octopuses that have the fins and this one is an octopus that has fins didn't have ink. Well, in the fossil record, they did. So they had fins and that ink sac as well. Wow, so we, yeah, we see sort of when features might have evolved and when they might have split off in, in different groups, yes. possibly. Wow, that's very cool. And if we, we, we've we kind of zoomed in, because there's a, is there a fish? In there is that a fish. Is that yes. dinner by any chance? Uh, no, it's not. Um, oh. It would be quite impressive if that octopus had eaten that fish, actually. Um, no, <laughs> so this is basically, it's gonna sound a bit, bit brutal um the fish died got covered by sediment then the octopus died got covered by sediment on top of where the fish was so it's like a little stack of death um and whoever was crafting this fossil maybe thought that there was some additional features of the octopus so they've done some more prep and covered that and then sort of stopped part way when they realized oh it's a fish i should stop so yeah that's why there's half a fish underneath the octopus <laughs> oh well not related but an amazing amazing specimen and it's not the only one we have um i think we've got a, a couple more that we can we can show um so is this a different species or, or the same species um so this is a different species so that paleo octopus is the only example of the paleo octopus that we have this is something called a coipia i have no idea if i'm pronouncing that correctly that's how it makes most sense for me to pronounce it um, and this is an entirely different genus of octopus. Um, this one is really cool because you've actually got the fossilised ink preserved. Um, and someone came to visit the collection and did took some samples of that ink to do some chemical analysis um, and discovered that they're pre it's pretty much identical to modern uh, octopus ink. Like it's full of the same sorts of melanins, which give it that nice dark black colour. And then this is the other part to that specimen that's incredible so that that ink preserved that well that we can we can tell its chemical yeah, it's uh, cool it's it's amazing yeah. and so we know that they uh, sort of 96 million years ago they they had ink so possibly yeah. it evolved much much earlier possibly so in the squid like animals that i mentioned earlier um from the jurassic some of those have ink so they're about 170 million years old and they have ink um, we had a couple of, of, of questions earlier. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer these, but um, David on YouTube, this is related to ink, was asking okay. what octopus ink was made of. 
So I'm not entirely sure what the entire chemical makeup of octopus ink is, but the thing that makes it black is that melanin. So that's the same, okay. uh, that's the same thing that colours our hair and colours our skin. Um, and Colin had, had asked uh, a bit earlier, are, are squid and octopuses born with a, a, a predetermined set amount of ink or are they able to, to make it at will? That's a great question. It's a brilliant um, question. So they're allowed to make, they can make it at will. So they have two structures that allow them to do this. They have an ink gland, which produces the ink, and they have an ink sac, which allows them to store the ink. So it's a little bit like a bladder, but for ink. Because if they had to make it whenever they wanted to use it, it wouldn't be as effective. But so they've got a little store ready for whenever they need to use it. And what's interesting in some of the um, fossilised squid-like animals, um, we've got a whole range of specimens that are the same species, but their ink sacs are different sizes because they died with a different amount of ink in their ink sacs. Very Which I think cool. cool. Yeah, just brilliant. Um, so, so going back to our, our fossil specimens, so our, our, our coipia, our earlier coipia specimens were a little bit smudgy, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit indistinct. But um, we that have one, one specimen. One. There's one that um, I actually do call smudgy because it is a bit smudgy. <laughs> um. <laughs> but we've got some brilliantly preserved specimens, haven't we? We've got this one here, for example. So this one, um, I showed this shortly after we acquired it. I showed it to one of the leading experts in fossil octopuses in the world. And he said it was the best preserved fossil octopus he'd ever seen. I don't know if anything better has been found since. I haven't, I, I don't know. Um, but I like to think that we've got one of the best, world's best preserved fossil octopuses in our collection. Um, and this one is, oh, it's just amazing. Um, pictures don't really do it justice. Uh, but you can see imprints where you can see where the suckers were along those lovely arms. This has got its eyes preserved, which is quite mind blowing that this 96 million year old animal still has its eyes preserved. Um, yeah, so incredible. you can kind of see where the eyes are. If you look where the, the arms are and it goes into mm. a narrow bit, slightly further up, there's a sort of white streak that goes down. The sort yeah. of blobby things near that white streak, that's where it's eyes, those, those are its eyes. That Isn't is that incredible. Just mind-blowingly cool. Um, and the, the little sort of black bit by the in the middle by the arms, would that be where the beak is? Um, the mouth I don't know. I can't remember if that this one has the beak visible. That might just be a... I haven't looked at this specimen for at least six months. Um, but that is about where the, the beak would be. But it could also be... Mm. It could also be um, a preservation, sort of like a mark on the rock, that bit. But yeah, that's possibly where... Sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. I mean, it, it, they're incredible, these specimens. Collection. <laughs> I know, we're separated from the collection. I have yeah. seen these specimens in the flesh and they are just wonderful. They're, they're some yeah. of my favourite parts of the collection. Um, so we can really zoom into some details. And I think the next image we've got is, is where the ink sac would have been. Is, that, is yeah. that right? Yeah, so you can see there's a little hollow. So if you look at the scale bar on the bottom, um, that's basically just like an enlarged ruler. And it's all in millimetres. So the second big division, the second centimetre along, if you look above that, there's a bit of a sort of cavity. It looks almost like a sort of meteorite hole in the ground, like mm. a crater. Um, that is the cavity where the ink sac would have been. The ink itself hasn't preserved in this case, um, but that is where its ink sac would have been. Absolutely amazing. So are, are museum um, specimens, are, are people studying them? Are researchers looking at them? Um, yes, so people come and visit these parts of the collection. Um, considering the fossil octopus collection is very, very small, um, I do actually have quite a high number of researchers coming and looking at it. Um, there's all sorts of interest in that particular specimen. Um, our exhibition teams are also get in touch quite a lot, and they're like, oh, can we, can we take this here? Can we do this? Um, which is really nice. It's nice to have a specimen that is so interesting. Um, to Absolutely. Also yeah. <laughs> and I'm often getting in touch going, Zoe, can we talk about ancient octopuses? <laughs> I love talking about them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've been looking at different ways of looking at these specimens as well, haven't you? We've got um, an image you want to show next where you've... Explain what you've done. Have you put it under a, a special light? Yes. Yeah, so um, with this sort of soft tissue preservation, it's very widely known that um, you can get more visibility if you show it under... If you take photos and look at it under UV light. Um, so this is what that same specimen looks like under UV light, you can see you've got a better idea of where its body, how big its body would have been. 
um, you can really see how bright those tissues are shining in the tentacle. No, arms. Gosh, arms. sometimes you can like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah, so all of that sort of pale, peachy, yellowy colour, that is the original phosphatized, fossilised tissue of that octopus, which is really cool. And then you can also see you've got quite a lot of blue flashing, um, and that is glue because this specimen was not found whole or it got broken oh. while covering it, so they've glued it back together. Now, we know that this is definitely the same bits of octopus, like the rock, the patterns in the rock all pass through and the, it fits it fits together perfectly because it is one specimen. But UV lights are also really useful um, to examine specimens if you're not entirely sure that it's just one animal. Um, so sometimes with trilobites in particular, some of the spiny ones, um, people stick bits of different trilobites together to almost design their own trilobite. And obviously that would be really, really bad if we had these specimens and we're writing papers going, we found a new species. And actually it's just a specimen that someone built. So knowing that glues shine in UV light is actually really, really useful. <laughs> For all reasons. Oh, I'm learning so, so much in this talk. <laughs> now, these specimens are, are, are fantastic. It's amazing to have them. Can we uh, tell anything about the relationship between these particular um, species and octopuses living today? Or, or is that relationship a little bit dif more difficult to work out? So you can do some quite cool what we call phylogenetic analysis is, or analysis um, um, with a molecular clock aspect to it. Um, there's all sorts of computer software that allows this sort of thing. Um, so using those sorts of analysis, various people have, dis have decided um, that these fossil octopuses are actually more on the inserate lineage. So the more shallow water ones, but not the cute, flappy, deep sea ones. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some features that really support that. So it would be easier for a, an animal to lose a feature such as ink, much like the, the serrate ones have, than for it to have evolved multiple times or to evolve later on. So that's more likely to be a sort of more basic characteristic so yeah so those fossil octopuses so it's likely that there was a split in the lineage before 96 million years ago so that we know they would have been around longer there were probably more diverse groups of them yeah i think that makes sense yeah so we can tell some things but obviously our fossil record is quite sparse so we can only learn so much from it absolutely it, it's tricky but it, it, it i think it's fascinating what we can learn um, yeah it's amazing isn't it yeah, we've, we've had a few more questions from, uh, okay. from our viewers, so I'll, I'll, I'll just get uh, through a couple of those. We had a really lovely question, actually, earlier uh, from someone on YouTube asking if um, octopuses change colour when they're asleep or dreaming. Which oh, is such a lovely question. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope, hope they do. <laughs> um, I would like to see if they do. I have absolutely no idea i do i don't know that much about the behavior of modern octopuses um maybe that's something you can look up i have no idea i'm afraid <laughs> no problem that was a really tricky good question, question yeah, yeah really good question um and we had a, a elijah um age seven on facebook was asking whether all types of octopus can camouflage I am, again, not sure. I saw that one pop up and I thought, oh, gosh, I don't. Mm, I would imagine for the deep sea um, octopuses, sea it, it probably isn't probably uh, not, a priority. No. <laughs> no. Um, in terms of the shallow or living ones, I would imagine, yes, most of them probably can. But yeah. don't quote me on that because I'm not entirely sure. I don't know <laughs> that no much problem. about all of the living octopuses out there. <laughs> But we do have a talk coming up with our, our curator of uh, living uh, Excellent. Yeah, So, so yeah, John uh, Ablett. So yeah, tune in in a couple yeah. of weeks and, and he'll be able to tell you. <laughs> yeah. He knows much more um, about the living ones than I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we did have, yeah, another great question actually from uh, Finley, age seven. This was on Facebook. He's, he's uh, from Australia and he was asking, how do you get a job at the museum? Um, I got exceptionally lucky. So I did my master's at the museum, actually. So I have a degree in zoology um, and a master's in taxonomy and biodiversity um, at Imperial College London, which is next door to the museum. So we have an arrangement. So a lot of that, that master's is taught in the NHM and it's a collaboration. Um, and I'm not a very sporty person. And <laughs> universities in the UK, I don't know if it's more global, 
um, tend to keep Wednesday afternoons free for sport. Um, I use my Wednesday afternoons to volunteer in the mollusk collections. Um, and then I also use the ammonite collection that I'm now responsible for, for my um, master's thesis. So I did a study on ammonites for my master's thesis. Um, and I impressed our head of collections at the time with my documentation and a, an internship type post came up. Um, I was encouraged to apply for it. I did. When that came to an end, I applied for a maternity cover position. I got that. And then my job came up because I was also in the fortunate position that there was no curator for the collections that I look after. And then they decided that they needed a curator, but I'd been sort of covering their sections anyway. So when I applied for that job, I was in quite a good position and I got it. Um, but yeah, a lot to get a job in museums and um, volunteering in museums and getting some experiences, the best way to get your foot in the door. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I volunteered at the, the museum back in the day and it was absolutely oh. brilliant. <laughs> Now, we are uh, almost out of time, I'm afraid, Zoe, but I did have one more question for you. Um, okay. And I, yeah, I was interested to know what your favourite octopus was, living or extinct? OK, so my favourite octopus is a living octopus. And I think it's the most badass animal in the oceans today. Um, it's not the most aesthetically, it's not the most beautiful octopus, but it's cool. So it is a species of octopus that displays the greatest size difference, so sexual dimorphism in the entire animal kingdom alive today. It's called a blanket octopus. The female can grow to about 12 feet long, the male an inch. <laughs> so quite a difference in size. Um, <laughs> and they're called a blanket octopus because the female between two of her arms on each side actually has this amazing membrane that she keeps in a pocket in her body. And if she wants to make herself look bigger or more menacing, she can unfurl this and sort of scoot around the ocean looking magnificent. It looks almost like a superhero cape. <laughs> but that's the coolest thing. The male is impervious, so not affected by the stings of Portuguese man of, men of war, which is an animal I was weirdly fascinated by when I was a child. Mm. Um, so they can go into the tentacle mask, break off some of the tentacles, and then they defend themselves by using these bits of tentacles as whips. I think it's the coolest animal in the world. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. As if octopuses weren't cool enough. <laughs> yeah. They can use weapons. <laughs> yeah. It's great, isn't it? I don't know how the Portuguese man of war feels about having his tentacles broken off, but who knows? <laughs> oh, Zoe, I always love talking to you. I always learn so much. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for chatting to us Very today, welcome. for telling us about octopuses uh, living, but also extinct as well, and showing us those amazing um, fossil specimens it's a pity yeah. we can't be at the museum actually with no. them in our hands but yeah. we've got the next best thing here those those images are very beautiful so so thank I'm you so much all day in the museum <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely um, and next time you come along we'll let you talk about brachiopods as well that sounds good i'll hold you to that brilliant <laughs> brilliant well we'll say goodbye to you for now thank you so much bye. again bye and thank you to you, our viewers, for all of your fantastic questions, including the ones that, that really foxed Zoe. I always like it when uh, our curators go, oh, I'm not sure about that one. Um, so absolutely brilliant. Uh, now, remember, we will be back with more Nature Live online. So we've got a fantastic talk on Tuesday at 12 with Erica McAllister. She'll be talking about flies. And we're here every Tuesday at 12 and every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Do check our social media feeds and our website as well to see what's coming up. But for now, we'll say goodbye. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and we hope to see you again soon.